afternoon. Welcome to today's DCRI Research Conference. It's a real pleasure today to introduce Hayden Bosworth, a friend and colleague who uh, is a behavioral scientist who works um, in the Division of General Internal Medicine here at Duke, as well as the Durham VA. Hayden, uh, his background is in psychology, initially uh, at Brandeis University, and then went on to do a master's and PhD at Penn State. Prior to coming to Duke in 1997 for a postdoc, that was a National Institute of Mental Health funded position. And then he stayed at Duke, uh, worked with the VA and the General Medicine Group. And since that time has been immensely productive. He, um, his interests are in um, patient and organizational level factors to improve chronic care outcomes using telemedicine and mobile health platforms. And he may or may not go back into the past, but initially he tried uh, a number of interventions to improve chronic disease care aimed at providers. And it took a, a couple years to figure out that that was um, ineffective. And over the, the few years that I've been here, I, I found that that's also ineffective. And a few years ago, we, we partnered to actually um, address patient level interventions for people with kidney disease. He's done a lot of work in hypertension, diabetes, obesity, um, addressing health disparities um, in a number of healthcare settings um, for his work. Um, he's been uh, the PI of um, over 10 trials and involved in dozens of others, mostly health behavioral interventions that span uh, the spectrum of uh, medical care in a number of uh, settings that include not only the VA, but other vertically integrated systems like National Health Service in England, uh, Kaiser Permanente, um, and uh, the Medicaid population here in North Carolina. Uh, he's been uh, honored with uh, the VA Undersecretary of Health Award, which is the highest honor a VA researcher uh, can achieve, and currently is also uh, not only a professor of medicine, but the um, associate director of the VA uh, Health Services Research in Primary Care at the VA um, um, HSRD. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Hayden today. Thanks, Dr. Thanks, everyone. Uh, the last time I was scheduled to give a talk at Duke um, was a diabetes grand round, so that's no doubt. So I thought that that was likely to happen today as well. But uh, since Uptil was facilitating this, I knew that he wasn't going to let me off the hook. So um, I'm here. Um, so I just wanted to frame what I'm going to talk about today. So um, as Uptil talked about, uh, most of my work is focusing on self-management. I'm going to use the context of medication adherence as the uh, framework to talk about. I want to frame what medication adherence is, why this is relevant and important, and then I want to try to transition why, how do we take efficacious studies that have been done, and there have been plenty done in medication adherence, and how do we transition this into implementation? Um, so uh, let me put my disclosures. I don't know why. Oh, sorry, just there, disclosures. Outline, just as I said, I want to talk about medication non-adherence, why this is relevant, important, talk about components of successful programs, and then transition to recommendations and the challenges uh, and some of the lessons we've learned in the context of implementation. So why is this important? There's 1.2 billion uh, provider physician, uh, patient interactions that occur. Uh, Patients forget about 80% of the information that's uh, obtained in interacting with the provider. Uh, and that among that information, about 50% of it is wrong. So huge problem. Um, how does this translate? So 28% of first-time prescriptions are never filled. 75% of all prescriptions go unconsumed. And that costs $318 billion in avoidable spending. Uh, another way of framing this is just uh, Eric uh, Peterson is not able to probably come because I just spent last week with him at a search meeting um, and talking about medication adherence. And the uh, important part of that is so, uh, A, Eric probably was worried I was going to say the same thing, which for if you do talk to him, let him know it's different material. Um, but to put this in context, the acting Surgeon General was the speaker at that meeting. Okay, so you know there's Coop and other Surgeon Generals. Sometimes we don't remember who those are. We have never had a Surgeon General 
who had raised the issue of medication on it. So I can't pick on Eric now. <laughs> so I was, I, I, just to put it so that Eric knows that I'm being honest, I said that you weren't going to come because you were worried I was going to say the same thing over again from last week. But no, different stuff. But, but I want to frame that this is important because while Eric and I were there, the Surgeon General did come and actually discuss this as a public health issue. So again, just some statistics. Uh, four or five US adults take at least one medication. Uh, and a quarter take five or more. Again, the cost. Um, there's also changes in the uh, use of generics, and we also legislation 30 million new healthcare patients into the system that are going to be engaging in using uh, these uh, medications. I think it's helpful to put this into history. So uh, when we talk about medication adherence, uh, the language has changed, and it's helpful to understand what the language is. So first of all, I think that uh, non-compliance or non-adherence has been around for a long time. So uh, Eve ate the apple in the Garden of Eden, despite somebody telling her not to do that. Um, you can look at Hippoc uh, so all the way from 1460 BC to uh, Sackett in uh, 76 introducing the term compliance. So many of us use that word compliance. It's no, in the field. We don't. That's not as acceptable. 93, there was a shift to compliance to adherence. Concordance, um, but uh, in 97, American Heart Association had a policy paper focusing on environmental influences. That was a big paper that uh, raised that. 2001 persistence, um, adherence in 2003. The point of all this, and then I put the 2014 acting uh, Surgeon General, we're getting more attention. Uh, the language is changing, but right now, uh, you know, there's even mesh terms and things. There's even journals now devoted towards this. So. Um, I just also, from, my, from what we'll talk about today, um, in general, it's a deviation from prescribed, prescribed dosing. Um, and then there's primary, secondary, discontinuation, persistence, intentional, and non-intentional. The reason why I'm putting this up there is because it has some context in terms of the numbers that we throw around um, and how we define it. But one of the interesting things now is that we have this model of looking at primary non-adherence because we can connect into the EHRs and find out who got a prescription and who chose not to fill it. So what we're finding in CVS and some of the other publications coming out of these large PBMs is about 25% of the patients don't even fill the prescription. So when we quote 50% of people not taking their medication, that denominator is assuming they've already gotten that prescription, they filled it, and choose not to take it. So it's even probably a wider issue. Um, now, one of the things that from this conference that Eric and I were at, um, the assumption here we're talking about is the medication's appropriate, you should be taking it, but you're not, OK? There's a whole area of appropriateness of medication use, shared decision making, and I'll talk just briefly about that. But those are really important concepts. But I'm putting those off to the side there for a moment and focusing on that this is a, uh, the right medication for the right person and uh, framing all that. Um, discontinuation occurs when this person stops taking the prescribed medication and persistence is the length of time between initiation and discontinuation of dosing. Um, for those that are in the field looking at this, we mess these terms up, so I just put those out there. They're important to consider. Um, but uh, they are measured differently. Um, but this is what we're talking about in terms of non-adherence. Again, in terms of non-adherence, there's the decision-making, disengaged uh, patient, inappropriate drug choice, poor communication, uh, disregarding information. So non-adherence typically is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more going on there. Um, and that appropriate medication use is uh, uh, foundations based upon shared decision making, empowered of engaged patients, good communication, and all these other things. I gave a talk at the World Congress of Adherence uh, recently, and my presentation was on shared decision making. Most of those people were in the audience were industry. Their concern and the reason why uh, that that was a big topic for them was um, that there's a push towards shared decision making and the idea of the patient provider communicating, working things through. Um, but their fear is, how do I monetize this? How do I do this in an efficient way? And that could be a whole separate conversation. But having this conversation with Uptel said, you know, if I have a kidney transplant patient that should be in immunosuppression, we're not really going to have a shared decision making. You either take the medication or you don't. And if you don't, there's significant problems. So where that shared decision making, it's an important concept. Um, but how do we engage and where that fits in is something um, that needs to be uh, thought through. But there's also culture, literacy, numeracy, a lot more. 
So let me put also why I think um, adherence is becoming a big important issue. So first of all, there's the Medi anybody familiar with the Medicare five-star program, MAPD, the Medicare Advantage Plan Part D. So healthcare systems can get money or are uh, based upon how many, uh, the, the proportion of individuals that are refilling the medication. And those are within the classification of drugs of hypoglycemic drugs, antihypertensives, and lipid lowering drugs. Uh, and this was added in 2012. There was a reason why those three classification drugs were picked. Um, cheap medication, generic, shown to work. So if someone takes them, it clearly there's a benefit. Um, and so there's also now ongoing conversation from uh, organizations like PQA of how to expand uh, these quality indicators. But this was the first time really having these quality indicators on the map and healthcare systems trying to figure out that this is something that we need to think about and that there's money on the table that if we don't address it, uh, we can be penalized um, um, and, and so forth. So just clearly losing two or five star yields a loss of $200 per member per year. So some real significant dollars can be, uh, now again, this is only in the Medicare Advantage Plan Part D, but there's some um, spillover effect that other he the healthcare systems are starting to think about these issues. Uh, other issues, so medical homes, uh, there's the plan managed care, um, there's also accountable care act, uh, organizations, meaningful use, um, so uh, ONC came out with meaningful use part, uh, uh, they were talking about part three, which is we were hoping to have more in their pill refill information. That's something that we're proactively trying to engage to get that back in there, but there isn't as much on the pill refill, but um, I, I think there's some important aspects there. Uh, the PCORI has really helped us focus on shared decision making, and that's kind of changed the environment. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid in Innovation has put money and moved towards medication adherence, and then the FDA benefit risk assessment. So there's a lot of changing policy and landscape issues regarding and acknowledging that medication adherence is a big problem, a big issue, and uh, from a different perspective, thinking about how we uh, address these issues. So just quickly, goals of appropriate medication use, uh, why it's important for better public health, better individual health, better health care, uh, more efficient use of public and private resources, uh, and uh, the financial rewards of, for doing the right thing. So, you know, costs for health care, I think, have been pretty reasonable the last two or three years, and some of that indication has been just trying to control the cost of medication and the use of that. Um, but appropriate medication use by patients is hard to do. Um, I just put some of these issues. Patient factors to consider, uh, choosing treatments, cost, time, cognition, literacy. Um, and each of these aspects right off the bat there could be a whole lecture on the role of cognition, literacy there. Uh, patient provider already shared decision making, prescribing the right medication, filling it uh, correctly, effective uh, co coordination among care providers, active engagement and patient participation. So from my perspective, I, I look at medication adherence as a behavior. Just as I would look at a diet, exercise, medication, uh, um, smoking. And I would actually argue because of the multi-level issues regarding adherence, it's probably the most complex issue and quite frankly, probably the largest public health issue that we have uh, right now. Um, and so, again, just a lot of the factors that are related to that. Um, now, again, the talk of what I wanted to try to focus on is how do we transition from efficacy to effectiveness towards implementation? So God knows that there's been tons of papers published showing these factors are related to non-adherence and tons of papers, and, and so in my mind, that's the first generation. The second generation are trying to understand what are the mechanisms, and the third generation that I would like to see us try moving towards is understanding and trying to change the system and, and improving and rolling those out into the real world. So in general, it takes 17 years to get evidence into practice. Uh, we often focus on does it work, uh, and then the efficacy, um, and then transitioning to effectiveness, and then sustainability, scalability, system sustainability. A lot of steps that need to happen, and you, it's no surprise why it takes 17 years, and. Uh, realistically, only 17% of projects or, or things actually get eventually implemented anyway. And we can talk about all the changes and issues regarding implementation. But I think, um, you know, just as an, as an aside, um, how many of you would love to get a five-year R01? Okay. How many years does it take you to get a five-year R01? 
to, to three to five years yeah. to work on it? Okay, and then w how long after that five year R01 do you uh, then, d does it take for you, for you disseminate the, the main outcomes of that paper or study? Don't say three or five. <laughs> <laughs> Two years maybe before it gets out in pub, press? Here we have an editor for an American Heart Journal. I mean, by the time the study's done and you see it, how long would you say? Two years would be fair? At least. At least. Okay, so my math is indicating that three years to do the study, five years to conduct it, two years to publish it. That's 10 years, okay? Where were you 10 years ago? I had hair back then. I don't know about you, okay? So 10 years is a long time. But that's the model that we're kind of in an academic setting. The healthcare system can't wait 10 years. So we can talk about methods and ways of, there's good science of how do you do it efficiently and, and um, wedge design and adaptive design. I won't go into all those, um, but there's a course that I'll be teaching in the uh, uh, fall that goes into all those things. And, but the point is, is that implementation just, is just as hard uh, to do as it is to get patients to change their behaviors. And I just put this there to, to think about it. So. Uh, as we talk about it, some of the things we're trying to do is identify successful things and then think about how we can translate that into the real healthcare system. So in terms of adherence here, clinicians must do to help patients. They must uh, increase patients' understanding. So there has to be some fundamental knowledge of the patients, okay? They have to be queued up a little bit. You have to provide counseling, some accountability, um, maybe ensure that the tools and strategies are there to help. Uh, Self-monitoring is a real key aspect that can be useful uh, if possible. And then uh, trying to think about affordable medications. Now the problem, as you can imagine, we have colleagues that are um, Peter Ubel looking at uh, cost of medication and oncology as a barrier. So many of us look at these things, but we look at the silos, and there needs to be a, perhaps more interaction. It's still really important to understand, do patients, do providers know what the cost of the medication are, and are they having that communication with the patients? That's just one part of the equation, but it's something that we need to think about. Um, in terms of my own work and where we are, uh, we have identified over 100 factors that are related to medication non-adherence. So again, as we think about implementation, how can I create a program or an intervention that potentially acknowledges the fact of all these potential issues? And we'll talk a little bit more about it. But um, I would argue that you could say perhaps there are eight or nine key factors that explain 70 to 80 percent of the variance, and not everyone is going to have those seven or eight issues, but can we identify quickly so that you're targeting the problem and then tailoring it to the potential needs? So as an example, not everyone has a side effect, but if they have a side effect, then figure out what that side effect is, and then you can perhaps funnel further down. So that's just example, some of the examples. Um, that we can talk a little bit more about. But our goal really is, is that um, figuring out how we can develop programs that are scalable, cost effective, and I'll talk about this in a moment, but there is really a different stage between initiating behavior and maintaining that behavior, and we need to think about those aspects as well. Um, just again, a schematic, I'm a psychologist by training, I'm a um, I'm recovering psychologist as I joke, but I think uh, we have theoretical frameworks that help us uh, drive where we look at. And again, this gives us some kind of uh, focus of what, what are, we think are some of the major issues. I won't go too much, but um, social cognitive theory would say you need to understand the risk and the benefit of the medication. Uh, there's a lot of different levels of cognition that are important, memory, inductive reasoning. I love to ask this question to um, the pharmacy uh, faculty when I go over to UNC and I ask them, uh, what does it mean to you to take twice a day medication? So, so if, I, if, you're, if I'm your doctor and I told you to take the medication twice a day, what would that mean for you? Morning and evening. Morning and evening. Okay. All right. Uh, not t two pills in the morning and I'm good for the rest of the day? Okay, so, so patients sometimes that, that very easily do that. So let's even say morning and evening. So what time did you wake up, Doc, today? Seven. Seven, okay. Um, what time do you wake up? Well, you probably wake up at seven o'clock on the weekend too, right? Yeah. No, okay, you sleep in? Yeah. Okay, but, okay, eight o'clock. Now, but now you're taking a medication three times a day. So, um, so let, let's do this. You're typically used to seven, but now it's eight o'clock. What would be the next time you take the medication? Maybe Doc, needs, he's a statistician. He may need help with math. So one, if he's taking it three times a day, when would be the next time if he wakes up at eight that you would think that he would need to take it? Quickly. Think. What? I got one. What else? I got two. Four in the afternoon. 
So, so this is, it's eight plus eight, right? You know, so it's four. So, so we, we got three answers from you all. So uh, hopefully, you're, I won't scale, ask you for your numeracy levels, but so now times it by eight or nine medications and you got a 70 year old who's you know, got a lot of other issues going on. That's just the basic cognition there, okay? Um, so you can start seeing what the challenges are. Uh, literacy, a huge issue. 40% of our primary care docs, uh, patients are functionally illiterate, which means they cannot understand the back of the Tylenol bottle. Anybody who's been over at Doc or Pickens, um, it may be even higher, the VA uh, similarly. Uh, coping stress, I'll, I'll present a paper that Eric and I, uh, we have a junior faculty member that wrote something on chaos in a moment. Side effects, mental health. So one of the most consistent predictors is depression um, or depressive symptoms. So that's just some of the patient characteristics. You have the provider characteristics, characteristics communication style, prescribing appropriately, uh, intensity of therapy, guidelines, um, their beliefs about it. There's the policy, the medical environment. So there's a lot going on here that can really impact whether or not uh, somebody decides to take the medication accurately or not. Now, mind you also, I'll come back to this in a moment, there's a reason why treatment adherence is not the primary outcome. It's actually kind of the secondary because um, it's also um, a hard thing to measure. Um, so uh, fundamentally, we typically would look at the outcome as the most important part and the kind of mediator factor would be adherence. Um, let's see. Again, so some of the provider factors, communication still, skills, knowledge, lack of empathy, positive reinforcement, um, understanding the number of comorbid conditions, uh, number of medications. Uh, these are just some of the specific provider factors that impact adherence that we need to think about. Um, as I mentioned, so one of the things that we've kind of lately have done is looked outside the box. Are there any good predictors of uh, non-adherence? And one measure that we found was a paper that we recently published called Life, Life Chaos. Uh, so how many are you able to get out your door uh, with all your material and your keys and your kids and, uh, and pretty much get to wherever you're supposed to be uh, on time uh, on a regular basis? Okay, of course Doc is going to raise his hand. Well, yeah, okay. Well, up till can attest, we drove up to Oxford today to meet the primary care. Uh, I was only five minutes late, but I, I still would say my life is a little chaotic. But the point is, is that this measure, um, which can be done very efficiently and effectively, uh, comes from the HIV literature, could be a, a good indicator of non-adherence. It's also something that's modifiable and useful. The important thing too is, is that typically we see uh, social economic and race as predictors of non-adherence and quite frankly those are not, you know, that you remember I talked about first, second, third generation. I want to know what I can modify, what, what can I identify as being a problem um, and so this is just as an example of something we can think about uh, as a potential screening measure um, down the road for us to think about. As an aside, there's also a lot of movement and uh, interest in using um, large claims data to predict non-adherence um, and there's actually been a number of companies that have made tremendous amount of money um, taking that data and fitting regression models to it and predicting uh, adherence um, but quite frankly there's only so much you can get out of those claims data versus getting the patient level information like side effects and perceptions and things like that so um, it's just as a side issue um, because of what healthcare plans are trying to do is stratify where do I put the, who are the high risk, who are the medium risk, and who are the low risk, so I can perhaps modify and link up interventions towards those. Um, so efforts to improve adherence are impeded by three misconceptions. Adherence is a single behavior. Hopefully by now I've convinced you that that's not the case. Uh, social demographic and clinical characters, characteristics can accurately predict adherence. Um, there is no consistent gender, age, race, it really doesn't necessarily, you can, for every paper that says males are not in here, I can find a paper that suggests women. So, and quite frankly, it's not gonna give me a lot in terms of thinking about programs and implementing them. And fundamentally, individual cl clinicians can improve patient adherence on their own. Uh, this takes a team basis, um, and um, we can have a conversation about this, but I don't think that uh, typically physicians are the best place for some of this work that we're talking about and you know, very rarely are they trained on how to measure and assess adherence, let alone intervene on it. So I think part of what we'll see is, is that um, individual clinicians, uh, it's a team effort to, to address these issues. Um, 
So uh, adherence is a complex set of behaviors. It's not a single behavior. Again, we've kind of already gone through all this already. So how can we develop some basic tools to pick from? So how do we identify all these potential issues? How do we put them together and do this in an uh, effective, uh, effective way that's based on evidence-based information? Um, but first, we need to think about how we're going to measure adherence, OK? And as I said before, our typical outcome is not necessarily going to be medication adherence. It's, it's part of the means to the end. Um, but I just put this table there to just put this in there. Um, I don't think that you know, one measure is ideal. I can tell you that there's a lot of, I sit on an SBIR, this is an NIH uh, small business grants, uh, and we see these cameras and pills and all these cool little gadgets. But um, the cost of these things are huge, and who's going to use them in the business model aren't really there. So the idea is, you know, I'm going to take a pill, I swallow it, but I still have to put that necklace on that tells me whether or not I've taken the medication. So it, it's all adherence. I still have to put that necklace on, and now I have to worry about, is it matching my clothing? And then the, there's a little thing on the pill. I mean, these are some of the things that we, we're seeing. But anyway, just in terms of relevant, uh, reliable, and cheap, um, you know, MEMS caps are a big thing, um, but those are really expensive, um, and, and they may not be useful for, uh, from a larger implementation level. They're definitely much more efficient for efficacy. Um, some of our own work, this is Carolyn Thorpe, she's at Pittsburgh. What she had shown was that pill refill, um, using kind of what the uh, CMS uses currently, uh, and then a self-report measure, the Kappa statistic was a 0.19, so not really high statistic. The interesting thing was that individually, they both predicted poor blood pressure control, and they also predicted um, non, uh, and bad outcomes. And similarly, what they did was, um, what we found was there were um, individuals that were low adherence. That's what we typically think of. Um, but there's also this stockpiling group that were 120% or higher adherent, and they were just as bad and problematic. It was as if we were looking at two of the same groups of individuals. So it was low adherence, perfect, or 80 to 100, which is still, a, we could argue, because that's just an arbitrary number, and then those that were higher of a 120. And so anyway, the point is, is that both pill refill and self-report were um, not correlated, probably captured some aspects of behavior. Um, but yet we're still uh, predictive of outcomes uh, down the road. So uh, it makes our work a little more challenging. Um, but in the end, uh, if we are focusing on the healthcare system and implementation, we kind of have to go along with uh, pill refill as the typical outcome that we need to focus on. So um, let, let's start talking a little more about in interventions and why uh, I think they haven't been implemented properly. Uh, medication adherence has not been measured in clinic practice. Uh, and I think that uh, typically it's unless it's in use of a drug such as anticoagulation monitoring. So the reality is, is that this is, unless there's already an infrastructure in place, it's really hard to measure this. And then there's a fear that if I am a clinician and I simply ask somebody, are you having any problems with the medication? It's like that phenomenon that they have their hand on the door and they're walking out the door and now I'm gonna have a 30 minute conversation after I've just spent 12 minutes or 15 minutes of my allotted time and now I have to do medication reconciliation. Um, and so we kind of either ignore it or um, we just don't have a good idea of measuring it. And if anyone has ever measured it through pill refill, it's not the easiest thing. What do you do with partial refills and all this other stuff? So if we could ever figure out a way to better automate it, I think it would be really helpful. I also think that there's, uh, again, lack of healthcare providers having the skills for behavioral assessments and interventions. These can be done relatively efficiently, but we need to do training on these issues. And then the time and resources. So, um, I think this is changing slightly as the healthcare system is um, being incentivized to deal with these issues. Um, but uh, again, it also may be who that appropriate person is. Is it nurse case managers or um, maybe you know, occasionally pharmacists um, to, to do that? Um, other issues, electronic health records I already mentioned. And then uh, I just don't think we've done a good job of uh, establishing evidence-based scalable interventions. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, so let, let's talk about how we identify what we want to implement. So this is uh, Roger's theory of innovation. So an innovation needs to have the relative advantage. It needs to have a perception that it's an advantage over a status quo. The compatibility, it's consistent with your values and experiences and needs. It's low complexity. So the easier you can do it, the better off you're going to be. 
and trialability. So nothing is better in terms of implementation if you allow people uh, opportunity to play with that. And quite frankly, they can be your own stakeholder, the, 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 uh, almost the best marketing, if you will, if they deem that this is relevant and useful. And I'll talk about some specific examples. And observability, the degree which results are visible to others. So these are just uh, Roger's theory of implement, uh, implementation and trying to identify an innovation. But I think these are really key components that we need to consider as we move forward. Um, again, so Roger's theory, uh, so it begins when there's a new innovation. So typically, we may have done an efficacy trial. We've shown something works. Now we're interested in deciding whether or not to uh, adapt that and move it forward. Um, and then uh, innovation. So when I teach a course, I always ask, uh, I, what, what is the newest uh, phone right now? Uh, for Is it iPhone 5? Is there anything else more recent? Samsung, okay. So, so what's the coolest gadget that if you really were like on top of something, like what, what would it be? I'm, I'm trying to imagine what that is. So, uh, what, Google, well, that's not available though. That doesn't count. You had, you had Google Glass? Okay, and did you feel cool or what? what? Extremely nerdy. Nerdy, okay, all right, okay. Uh, but that, that's not uh, available to the general market at the moment, so that, that may not be a good case. Um, all right, what's that? Fitbit. Fitbit, okay. So how many of you have Fitbit? All right. Okay, and, and how many, when did you go get Fitbit? When it first came out, or did you have to wait until like uh, other people like wrote some comments on it? You want to come out? Well, you, you have the inside connection, so the rest of us have to wait. Uh, but, but so the, the fundamental point of this is that there are early adopters and late adopters, okay? There are individuals that go out and get the first thing, the newest thing, and they want to be kind of try it, and they're the, they're the guinea pigs. And then there's me who's still driving my car that's 10 years plus, and uh, it still works for me, and uh, I, I'm, I'm stuck with that, and I'm just lazy. Um, um, and, and, but the same thing is with the healthcare system. So just as an analogy with the uh, new drugs that came out for equivalent for warfarin, what is it, uh, Xeralto um, and all those other drugs, we were curious to see where they were going. Uh, and so it ended up like uh, in the VA system, Denver was the place that was using these medications like uh, gangbusters. So anybody who's been to the Denver VA may have some sense of why that's the case. Who, who's there at the Denver VA among cardiologists? Well, yes, so, so we have John Rumsfeld, who's the director of all VA research, cardiology, and they have more, car cardiologists are working in the primary care, they, they don't have enough uh, positions, so they, they stick them in primary care. So they, they have all these cardiologists, uh, whereas the Durham VA was not, nobody was prescribing any of these drugs. So again, the point is, is the healthcare systems in terms of innovation, there are slow adopters and um, big, uh, uh, faster adopters, but part of that too is relevant to familiarity, believing in this, uh, the triability and, and uh, comfortability of all those things. So this is just another schematic of that and another analogy of why certain things get picked up quicker in some places than others. Um, so some of the evidence, uh, effective interventions, so, um, we had this conversation, again, adherence is a process, it's not your outcome. And typically, you need two or more interventions that address uh, different dimensions of adherence. So, um, you know, blister packaging is, a, is a, an area where we spend some time. That's not going to get us to adherence. It's just part of the equation, and it may be that 2 or 3% improvement in adherence. Um, but what we see are small to modest effects uh, for adherence, and that, uh, and basically, uh, you know, we're not doing a good job of disseminating, and, and the strength of the evidence is typically low to moderate. Um, the, oftentimes, the studies are often too small, too short, poorly conducted and reported. There's a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, intermediate outcomes are looked at. Um, that they don't uh, evaluate the uh, individual components, so it's just a global impact, and it's hard to disseminate what those parts are. Unlimited generalizability. And also, uh, only one disease regimen is studied. So um, imagine you have a cardiovascular patient, uh, and you're only looking at lipids, but then they have all these other medications and all the problems. So if you're only looking at that one disease, uh, there's, there's a potential uh, impact that's lost there. So these are just some general comments regarding, I think, some of the challenges of why um, we haven't done as good a job of uh, implementing them. Um, 
So some strategies. Let's talk about, so uh, hopefully um, what I framed are some of the challenges. Now let's try to figure out some of the solutions. Uh, Team-based care, pharmacist-led components of interventions. Um, you know, in the Duke healthcare system, we don't have too many pharmacists, and many of us don't know how to in, uh, incorporate them. But um, quite frankly, they have to come out behind the CVS and the Walgreens counters from counting the drugs and figuring out ways to implement them and put them into the healthcare system. So um, th I think that's something that's going to happen and it's going to move more as uh, reimbursement comes up. Um, I think education behavioral support will always be key, but that's under the one part of the equation. It's not the full. Uh, Pill counting, monitoring, all that's going to be important. Blister packaging I already mentioned. Uh, so these are basically, um, so some companies are now coming out with it. It's just like uh, for birth control where you can do or uh, for steroids that you can see if the medication has been taken or not and you could put days and times on it. Uh, the FDA is still some regulations on what's permissible and what's not. Uh, as a side note, what we're seeing also is uh, where do most people take, put their amber vial medications? Where, where do they store them typically? In the bathroom. So, okay, windows, but let's just go with the windows, uh, the bathroom is, is the, uh, the right answer at the moment. So what, 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 what happens with the bathrooms? The moisture? Yeah, high humidity. So um, some uh, recent data that's going to be published shortly is showing the potency of some of these drugs are decreased by 40%, and you have a 90-day supply that's sitting in a moisture-contained amber vial. You're opening it and closing it. So the blister packaging actually may have some safety implications that are still being uh, pursued. Um, but anyway. Hard job to get them out of the package, at least the ones that are over the counter. Um, so I think some of the, the and, and that has been a, a general complaint, um, but, um, um, you know, I think the other complaint is, is it's a bitch to also open up an amber vial that's uh, adult proof as well as child proof too for some individuals. So um, are we going to hit it all? No, but I think the reminder there is, you know, I woke up and I can see whether I popped out my pill or not. Um, and some of the uh, companies are coming out with easier ways. But again, those are also FDA regulations on how much pressure, how much aluminum, and what's behind it. So, um, you know, it's not for everyone. And the thing is, is uh, you don't want blister packaging for one drug, but you got eight other drugs that you're putting in your pill container, uh, which is a separate issue that just because somebody puts them in a pill reminder doesn't mean that they're also, that they have to assume that they know how to put it in the pill reminder. And I can tell you that uh, at least my in-laws do not know how to put it in the pillow. So even though they think they put it in correctly, that doesn't mean uh, that that's consistent. So it could actually be just as problematic. But, you know, so some pharmacies may be eventually at the point where they can do the blister packaging and they can provide that as a, as a service. Um, telecommunications monitoring and then single dose, multiple doses, just some suggestions on effective strategies. Um, so just again, another simple, uh, simplify the regimen, impart knowledge, modify patient's belief and behavior, provide communication and trust, leave the bias, and evaluate the adherence. So this is just one model um, of a simple um, uh, way of addressing these issues. Um, some of the other lessons learned, uh, many of the proposed solutions are not scalable because they, uh, they're inadequate detail to be reproduced, as I mentioned. Resource intensive, uh, require substantial policy changes, or are too complex to be scalable and can't be easily adapted for the real world. Um, and, and what I would say is, is that there isn't going to be, imagine a step level program, okay? So what we're seeing is, is that most people typically need some recommendation, some check, um, and it could be something low intensive. The idea then is, is then to scale, identify and triage who needs something a little bit more, a higher touch. Maybe that's when you start doing nurse case manager, telephone calls. Um, but, you know, the reality, they don't need to, the, maybe it's only that getting that 5% that really needs to be in front of a pharmacist because the medication regimens are so complex that there needs to be some interactions and, and things along those lines. But the way that trials and studies are uh, addressed are typically, I, it's this program and we're going to do it for 12 months or 24 months with no flexibility of uh, changing it based upon the level of intensity that needs to be done. And I don't think that that's kind of, you're tailoring, targeting on dosage of um, uh, of necess the uh, amount of effort that's required, and we haven't done a good job there. Um, I just, again, I mentioned this before, I just want to highlight too, a lot of the work also is focused on initiating the behavior, 
um, the willingness to use the medication. Um, but uh, imagine that you're on a chronic medication and you're on it for 10, 15, 20 years. For many of us, once the patient comes in, they're on the medication, we rarely will check in and, and, and see how they're doing. And if we do, it's a quick conversation. But um, the focusing on sustaining behavior maintenance is really key. And those are different aspects that we can talk about. But those are parts of the uh, stages that I think are just as important. And then some of the, base, the evidence-based factors that we've found is um, motivation, readiness to change, self-efficacy, confidence, problem solving, positive and negative framing, cueing, chaining. So I always give this example. Um, you know, I have to take my cholesterol medication. I take it at night. For the life of me, I could not uh, remember to take my simvastatin. And um, I just because it was a hectic day and every night I would just forget to take it. So it wasn't until my wife finally said, Hayden, your breath stinks, brush your teeth. And then I said, okay, I can't get into bed until I brush my teeth and I put that medication right by my toothbrush. So if I, she reminds me if my breath smells, I need to take my medication and I see it right then and there. That's chaining and cueing. It's not necessarily rocket science, but these are some of the techniques that can be useful for individuals that to help incorporate it. So what we're trying to do is a habit, okay? We're trying to initiate, um, and this is the assumption too is again, you're supposed to be taking the medication. We can have a whole separate conversation on opioids and all the other things where we don't necessarily want you to be uh, as adherent uh, in the sense of uh, uh, for chronic. I'm, I'm framing it within chronic disease um, with cardiovascular disease in mind. So setting realistic goals, actions, self-reward, rehearsal. So again, uh, another area that's been a lot of interest is behavioral economics. So incentivizing individuals with co-pays and things like that. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on it. You know, the reality is, is that the data is um, still being produced. Um, I don't think we're seeing much more after 12 months. I think that my sense would be is it's a good kick in the butt, but um, what are the ethics and long-term sustainability of paying people to take their medications? And I still think we need a lot more focus on that. But I think it's part of that, but I don't think, again, it's one solution that's going to get us there. So let me just comment briefly on technology. This is a paper that Eric and I and Leah Zolig um, uh, published. Leah was the first author, and I really would encourage you, if you have an opportunity, Leah is this, uh, she's going to be coming on faculty in July, and she's just great, um, and she put this together. Um, but I think technology is part of the equation. There's a lot of cool devices coming out there, um, pill monitoring, electronic monitoring, mobile health, online resources, but that's not going to get us over the hump. It's just part of the tool, OK? Um, but And um, I think we just have to be mindful that the next clear gadget isn't really, there's a lot of gadgets, a lot of things coming out there. We need to evaluate them. We need to research those. But that's not going to be the entire solution. I think it's still that content. It's the information. It's working through the risk and the benefit, the side effects. And how do you incorporate that back into the healthcare? Is it care coordination? Where are the providers in all this in closing that cycle? Um, again, technology solutions, I think. Um, and then that's also data standards, interoperability, privacy, confidentiality. These are still things that need to be worked out and I think are really important. Um, but I don't think that this is going to be it. And again, I mentioned the predictive modeling. That's been a real big, hot area. Um, but the predictive modeling is one way. It's just the claims data predicting, and typically you can predict up to 12 months. What we're not seeing, and I haven't, is how do you pull in some of that patient level data to inform that to, to get a better sense of that. So if you imagine you're on some chemotherapy for breast cancer, you're having side effects, you're having, um, you know, those things are not in the medical records. So you want to know if someone's having hot flashes and they're on some type of for breast cancer, some type of medication, you want to be able to respond to that and have that. So that's that two-way kind of part. Then that's where maybe technology can play an important role. Um, I mentioned this brief briefly. I just want to just highlight personalized, target, individualized, and tailoring. I think that um, patient-centered is more towards the individualization and the tailoring. So the targeting is, are you having a side effect, yes or no? And then figuring out what that side effect is, and then the tailoring is giving that specific information based upon that particular side effect. So imagine you identify where the problem is and then driving further down into that. And I think this is where content and information are always going to be key um, in, in a way to schematic, and I think get towards that patient-centered uh, aspects. 
You mentioned the step level um, care. I, it's just, I think we have to be mindful that uh, trying to triage individuals and putting them in the right uh, queue uh, is going to be really important, getting them the right dose, and, and being mindful that they can change over time too. Um, sometimes they're you know, doing well and then they hit a bad spot, capturing that data in real time and then trying to re-engage uh, them where they may be. So I just want to kind of try to solidify some of the uh, principles that I've talked about and walk through some examples. Um, so one trial that we did um, is uh, the NC Medicaid study. This is a paper we published a couple years ago. Um, and a couple of lessons we learned from this. This was, uh, we, they approached us um, regarding hypertension and diabetes. And uh, we had done, at this point, three or four trials and published in them papers uh, on the trials. And they were all pretty successful. Um, and they said, well, um, you know, we don't need all four of those trials. That's great. But we would have liked to have kind of had this conversation five years ago um, because, you know, one trial probably would have met our criteria for showing that it worked. Um, my perception and being in academia was, well, I got four trials. I still have another five or six to go before I can definitively say, yes, it works. Uh, for these people and so forth. So there's this disconnect between what the healthcare system probably needs and what we think of. Um, and um, quite frankly, they're not reading our papers and, and the publications. And so we need to do a better job of how do we disseminate this information. So that's a side issue. So this was an implementation project. And what they ended up doing was saying, OK, can we have your content? We, we have four case managers that represent four counties, um, and we're going to just put it right into our medical records and use this as a tool, which you know, Duke or the VA would never allow you to take a software program and implement it right into their electronic medical record. They did this, um, and you know, th that was their uh, issue. I don't, you know, scared the hell out of us, but this was a couple years ago. Um, and, but they had four case managers. So when we presented it, it was a room like this. There must have been every county has each uh, a case manager. And there were four that stepped up and said, I really want this. This is something I think our patients want. It's something we can use. And we, we weren't thinking of this as a research. This is just kind of, OK, we've done this. Um, nobody else is using it. Um, and I can't write any more papers off of this. Maybe somebody can benefit from it. So these four case managers took the content. They kind of uh, worked with us and said, well, how about we change some of this? And we're like, no, 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 no. Before you change it, there's a theory, theoretical framework. There's a reason for it. Let's talk a little bit before we slice and dice and change things. So, but they also had a feel, they felt like there was an ownership of what the content was. In, in reality, it was about 95% of the same content that we had done prior into the interventions. Now, we, we gave it to them, and they went off, and they enrolled whoever they, you know, we, we couldn't dictate who they enrolled. Um, but the medication possession ratio, which is their criteria for, uh, that they were using, was that there was about 55% of the population, this is Medicaid, were filling their prescriptions 9 to 12 months. So it's a pre-model, pre-post, 55% prior to the intervention implementing this. Um, and then after, uh, 12 months later, or 9 to 12 months later, we got 77% improvement in uh, adherence. Now, we could have stopped here and said, that's, that's great. Uh, a 22% improvement in adherence, first of all, also gets us close to, um, it's about a two to one, uh, one to two star rating on the, I'm sorry, five to star, four to five, I got the directions wrong, on the MAPD, the Medicare Advantage Plan Part D. So money, uh, if, if this was the case, they could have financially got a good amount of money. This is prior to all that. Um, but so you can imagine, okay, selection bias. They, they picked all their friends, they picked the special patients that they wanted. Um, you know, and, and that, that's what it is. Um, so the only other way, so this is again where met, good methodologists come into play. What we did was and said, okay, let's, okay, that's, that's the improvement, 22%. Uh, clinically is meaningful, we have a pre-post, but what we also took was the 4,000 individuals who would have been eligible for the program who didn't get the program as a comparison, okay? It didn't get published in JAMA, we didn't send it to JAMA, we didn't send it to American Heart Journal, we published in Implementation Science, knowing full well that there were some challenges with the design. But for the 4,000 that met all the criteria, there was no movement. They stayed consistent over time. So can I definitively say it's the program? Not necessarily. But there was a still something meaningful moving in the right direction of a 22% improvement. And so some of these, the lessons here are, A, um, you know, from our perspective, it was an easy program. We gave it to them. They ran with it. 
um, and uh, we improved it. Subsequently, it's now being used uh, in across all, there's about 3,000 Medicaid patients that now have gotten the program because it's in the medical records and they're utilizing that. Um, so that's just one example. Here's just kind of a schematic of all that. Uh, another example is the cholesterol hypertension glucose education. It's a um, change study. It's uh, 360 African Americans with type 2 diabetes. This was a 12 month intervention, um, and that they basically got medication management facilitation. So, this was uh, similar the nurses calling the patients. Uh, because of the medical records, we really could not uh, assess pill refill. It was challenging, but uh, in general, 92% completed the 12 month program. 42% uh, reported inadequate income, which is the inability to pay their bills. Um, and 40% were making less than $10,000 a year, um, so a pretty low uh, SES group. And then uh, basically the uh, self-reported medication non-adherence uh, decreased by 22% uh, from 68 to 46%. So still a high non-adherence rate, but movement in the right direction. The control group, again, um, did not improve too much. So. Um, you know, the rigorousness of the science is not the same if it was an efficacy trial, but again, the, the, the reality is this is the real healthcare system. We're dealing with some challenging individuals, still trying to put methods around it so we can get some sense of what works and what doesn't. Um, but anyway, that's just one, another one. Um, colleagues, uh, Mike Ho, uh, this is a foresight program that we did in the VA uh, for, uh, what was this, acute coronary syndrome, hospital discharge. Um, and this was a multifaceted program. So this was a little bit more intensive. There was medication reconciliation, patient education, collaborative care, and voice messaging. Um, four sites, uh, and just, just some of the inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria. This, they did have access to the VA pharmacy. And just basically what you found is in terms of primary, there was a movement, so uh, improvement of PDC was possession uh, medication ratio, and then the sensitivity analysis. So um, the important thing, too, is then we have to look at cost. So that's the other part of what we need to think about. So I always say that we can create programs that work, um, but if we don't consider the cost, um, it, it'll never get uh, taken up. And so um, we're working on a paper now, and we were trying to find efficacious studies that had costs and um, data around it. And I'll tell you, it was really hard to find uh, any of those uh, programs. We found like three studies um, and then subsequently published, submitted it, and uh, they rejected it and said, there's got to be more studies out there that have adherence as your outcome and intervention that's also scalable um, because it had like the Asheville Pharmacy study and they said that's not realistic and that's not scalable. Um, but anyway, so uh, some cost information. So improvements. Um, you know, not cost savings, pretty close to cost neutral, um, which I think is still uh, important to, to consider. Um, just again, back to the issue of targeting and tailoring, I just put, put this up here, is that I think this is a, a, an example of uh, kind of a uh, cardiovascular patient that we would typically involve. And so we have all the different issues. So while I've talked about medication adherence, I want to make sure too that this isn't taken out of uh, context. I think medication adherence is part, one part of all the issues and that um, there's issues regarding uh, diet, exercise, and depression and all these other things. So part of what we do in self-management is we pick our behavior and forget about all the other behaviors and the reality is, is that uh, patients have a lot of issues and if we only focus on one part in terms of interventions, programs, I think we miss something. So our goal is how do we do this so that it can be done uh, we're not having five-hour conversations with individuals. How do we do those efficiently? And so this is just a schematic of uh, some of the things that each encounter we could possibly discuss, but then we also, if there is no issue regarding medication adherence, we'd move on. If there are no issues regarding side effect, we can move on. So that's where the targeting is. So we quickly assess the issues, and then if there is an issue, then we can tailor and, and dive a little bit further. But their goal is, can we do this uh, most often over the phone in a 15, 20-minute conversation? So in summary, I think medication adherence is a significant but complex problem. Uh, it requires a focus on the patient, healthcare provider, and policy level. And again, I think uh, the lessons learned is even though at the end of the day it's the patient's decision whether or not he or she takes that medication and puts it in their mouth, there's a lot of complexity in terms of whether or not that is, happens. I think the times are changing. I think the policy landscape incentives are ch uh, really changing and aligning, and we really um, um, you know, pharma, for example, right now is realizing um, 
that uh, it's that if I produce a fifty thousand dollar oncology drug or I have these new Hep C drugs coming out, it is unethical not to think about how I'm going to frame that within a context of adherence and and put that in there. And so, you know, maybe they're adding that into the cost. I don't know, but they're beginning to have these other conversations. The healthcare systems clearly are thinking about this. It's an issue. Um, uh, staffing in, in terms of jobs, um, again, I mentioned the pharmacists coming up from behind the counter. CVS has really pushed this a lot, uh, and those roles are changing. I think there's a continue re reviewing the methods for improving collaboration and medication adherence, and still we need to do a better job of understanding the mechanisms. But personally, I feel like at this point, um, if I, I'm an editor for uh, JGIM and uh, patient education and counseling, and if I get another paper saying I've done a qualitative study looking at uh, why there is not adherence in a particular disease, I, I think I'll, I'll, you know, uh, I'll lose it. Uh, and so there's nothing really new and novel there. What I think what we're trying to figure out, what we need to do is move towards some more programs and interventions. Some of them may fail, but we need to start moving and putting our money. I mean, how many more meta-analyses? We have meta-analyses of meta-analyses of not adherence. So uh, I think when we're at that point, we realize that there's more that needs to be done. Um, other issues, summary, one size doesn't fit all. So I think this idea that we're going to create an intervention, do a trial, and it's going to be the same thing for 12 months is a bunch of baloney. And I don't think that that's the where it is. I think we need to also methods for implementing these interventions. We have to do a better job of training people on how to do implementation. We don't have a lot of local people doing implementation dissemination and doing that in a very rigorous methodological -ish way. I think technology is really cool, but I don't think that that's going to be it. It's not the panacea. Uh, and cost of implementing the intervention. So cost is going to be fundamentally always an important issue. Reimbursement, um, I mentioned multi-levels, stakeholders um, are important. So just some of the challenges. Uh, separating wheat from the chaff, there's a lot of noise out there, a lot of garbage. Uh, trying to figure out what works, what's proven. Again, the scalability, ROI, sustainability, and the ROI I think is really crucial. We have to figure out what that ROI is. So is it patient satisfaction, which may be adequate, or is it um, uh, saving money for the healthcare system? I mean, there's just different ways we need to think about that. And then identifying partners, um, messaging content. So that's me, and then I'm supposed to put that up there. So thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much, Hayden. Any questions? Rob, want me to start off? Are you going to tell me that you're on an antibiotic and you haven't sure. taken uh, your seven days? <laughs> I remember. Well, I have two drug hypertension, so um, oh, okay. I, I can give a long story of non-compliance. <laughs> um, I, you know, I guess the fundamental question is, um, is this now out of the realm of academics, or should this really become a business? Because um, doing these little studies and you know waiting three years to get your NIH grant funded, and then by the time you do it, mm -hmm. the world has moved on. And then you look at the world of gadgets and gimmicks and right. companies; they're moving at a much faster pace. Yeah. So, um, what, what do you what do you actually think the role of the academic yeah. is, other than sort of the stodgy guy, guy who says the methods are not very good? So. I'd like to think I can live in both worlds and, and have been trying to do that, quite frankly. And so I think there, there was a feeling in my perspective for a long time that industry was, you know, I just want to stay away from it. And there is a problem with industry, and I think we have to be transparent, but they also can execute and scale these things up quite large and quite effectively. Um, you know, we've tried doing stuff with eScript. You know, they, they have hundreds of millions of, they, they could do trials in two weeks for the amount of time it is. So. I, I think that there's a role, and there's good science and methodology that's coming out. The adaptive designs, wedge designs, that we can still do that. But I think NIH fundamentally is structured totally different from what we need to do. We don't have the luxury, and the healthcare system doesn't have five years to figure this out. So um, we have to kind of figure out how to mesh those two. Now, we don't have to necessarily work with industry, but what do we want as a criteria for success? Is it to publish? simply at the end of the day a trial a new england journal of medicine and say we're done and hope that people read that journal understand the protocol and then can move forward with it i don't think that that's really the case anymore i don't think i i, I publish i want to do that 
But I don't think the healthcare systems and the people that we've been talking to, Medicaid, they don't have the, they're not reading these articles. So we, as in academia, either have to figure out how do we adapt to meet their needs, or we're going to be no longer useful in any way. Um, so so I, I don't know. Sure. Do I need a, oh, really? I don't need No. All right, good. Yeah. Um, I, um, we can't hear you, Rob, but you do need it. Thank you. All right. Um, you mentioned the 100 million, you know, the, the, big, the big guys that are controlling the prescription yeah. drug distribution industry. Uh, some people know Google's going to be here the next couple of days. And, you know, what we've just learned, which actually is not new information because they've published about it and written about it, is that every little thing they do um, is done through a randomized trial. Every single little thing. In fact, when you're uh, doing a Google search, you're actually participating in a grid of randomized trials, not one, but often six at a time, right. to optimize every little thing about the relationship between your experience on the website um, and their advertising revenue. Um, it seems like our stodgy way of thinking about it, you described it well, but you know, how many years does it take when you've got hundreds of millions of people taking these prescriptions, you could optimize the system knowing that you were right because you used randomization right. fairly quickly. Yeah. But there's something that keep, is keeping us from doing this. What, what is it? You know, I, and, and uh, that's a great example. So you're using, so we as academia are well trained to do the methods. And the industry may or may not know how to utilize those methods. So, again, more of a reason to pull together. I, I don't know. I, I, you know, my my more adherence that I do it puts me more in role with industry. And I, sometimes I feel like I'm talking this way and they're talking this way. And I, I, I feel like maybe I should go get an MBA. So I, I'm still trying to figure out what what they're looking for and how to align what our needs are. Um, but I don't have a good solution. I think you, you hit it right on the nose, and, and I think it's a big issue for us. Um, and, and quite frankly, too, I think, you know, again, PCORI and NIH are wonderful, but if those funding lines are at 10%, what of us, the rest of us in academia, we, you know, you can't, it's harder and harder to make a living off of that type of thing. So I think we need to figure out those roles and those relationships, but how to do that in a good scientific, methodological way that we also can keep our integrity. I don't, I, uh, maybe others have figured this out, I don't know. I just want to uh, follow up on Rob's question because uh, I wonder if the problem isn't uh, one that there's no connection between where the piles of money are and where the desire to do this is. And the other is that unlike Google, when we decide to randomize, we have to actually get permission and get you know, all this IRB stuff. And, yeah. and that creates a huge impediment. I mean, it's necessary. And obviously, we, you know, we get trained every year so that we understand why it's necessary. Why is it necessary? Because the IRB says it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> it will get punished if we don't do it. Can I, can I comment? But, but no, <laughs> there was an editorial uh, just the other day, I think, in one of the major journals questioning whether we've gone overboard on this. Quality year. improvement, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, you, you uh, said what I was thinking, um, which I think actually is the clear message. Um, in the sense of researchers, if we, if we have a, a common uh, dependent variable, with industry, then it's easy. And, and in fact, you know, what really drove Google is I've learned the whole story. <clears throat> they quickly realized that observational methods could not allow them to infer causality. It just would not work, even with the best data miners in the world. So um, they rapidly went to a system. And you can't start a randomized trial at Google without going through a very rigorous methodology committee that looks at every aspects of your methods. It's actually much more rigorous than what um, we do. But this thing about consent, um, we, we've got to figure this out because in essence what we're saying is we would prefer to be ignorant and know that we're holding back knowledge than, than to come up with a method that enables progress to be made rapidly to improve health. And 
you know, that's abundantly clear to everybody, but you might argue it's a human value for health to just be ignorant and die quickly, maybe. <laughs> maybe that's okay, I don't know. But I, I actually think that those are the two key issues, at least as I've tried to think about it over the last couple of weeks. One is defining a common defendant variable. The fact is industry doesn't necessarily make more money if people are more compliant, although there's a strong argument they could. We haven't convinced them of that. Um, and then the other part is you actually have to tell people when you're doing an experiment when it uh, affects health directly. Although you could argue that being enticed to click on, um, I won't name some of the things people click on, uh, <laughs> could be very adverse to your health also. <laughs> but it's okay for Google to do it. What about questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, you mentioned that you have a fine line